Okay, everybody. Sorry, I'm a little bit late. Okay, we're going to start the Chumash of the day. We're starting today is Tuesday, I believe. 14th day of Sivan. So we're holding on day, we're holding in chapter 9, the third reading of the uh, Torah on the portion of Baalotcha. Chapter 9, verse number 1. God spoke to Moses in the desert of Sinai. In the second year, from when they went out of the land of Egypt. Uh, the first month. First month, the portion at the beginning of the book of Numbers was not said until the month of Eir which is actually the second month. From this, you learn that there's no chronological order in the Torah. There's no chronological general. There's no chronological order in the Torah. Very important thing to know that. You cannot uh, ask a question on a time value or things that are written first and second or third. There's no, there's a general rule. There's no chronological order in the Torah. In the Torah. Well, I'm a part like Pascha Bezuk. Why didn't scripture begin this with this chapter? For it is a disgrace for Israel that throughout the 40 years the children of Israel were in the desert, they brought the Passover, they brought this Passover sacrifice alone. So they only brought one time in the desert to sacrifice the Passover, did the Passover. After that, they didn't do the Passover for many technical reasons. They did not do the Passover in the desert for 38 years. Verse number two, Vayas B'nei Sosa Pesach, and the Jewish people did the Passover, B'mayadai in its time. So now she says, B'mayadai in its time, even if it fell on Shabbos, it still did the uh, the, the Pesach, uh, the Passover, B'mayadai af betumah, whether if they were impure, if the nation was impure, they did the sacrifice. There was only a single person that's impure, pure, he cannot bring the sacrifice. But if the, if the community is impure, then they can bring the carbon. They can bring the sacrifice. By verse number three, by Boaz Yem Lachaydish on the 14th day of the month. Lachaydish is there on this month, the month of Nisan. Bein har bayim. In the afternoon, Tasu Oisi, you shall do the sacrifice of the Passover. The whole Klukav, all its statutes, and Mishpatav and its laws. Tasu Oisi, you shall do it. And as she says, these are the, when it says the whole Klukav, its statutes, these are the commandments directly relating to the body of an unblemished male and its first year, that the obligation be a carbon, a sacrifice. A Passover has to be a, a male, a male animal, lamb, that has no blemishes. And what are the ordinances? These are the commandments that relate to its body from elsewhere, such as the seven day for eating unleavened bread, for the supposing leavened bread, another version, the commandments relating to its body, an unblemished male is the first year of the those which relate to this body from elsewhere, it must be re-roasted over fire, its head with its leg and its innards. And those which have no relation to the body, unleavened bread or disposing of leaven. So whether, whether it's we're talking about the carbon itself, the sacrifice itself, or it's talking about other concepts that are connected to the sacrifice, whether you're not allowed to eat bread on Pesach, etc. Verse number four, we dab and my shop and a so last a pasach and God spoke to the box and Moshe. I'm sorry, Moshe spoke to the Jewish people to make the pesach to, that they should do the Passover in the desert. Verse number five, yes, that's a pasach that the Jewish people made Passover. The Jewish people made the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the desert of Sinai. All the laws of the Passover, which we are commanded to do, Cain also b'nei Yisrael. That's what the Jewish people did. Verse number six: Vayi anoshah shetmei lanefesh adam. 
there were certain people that were unclean because they got in contact with the dead. So they were unpure. And they could not do the Passover, the, that Passover, the second year going out of Egypt. And they came to Moshe and Adam. That's what does that mean? They were two sitting in the study hall. It must have been a base of Medrash, a study hall in the desert. And Moshe and Adam, Moses was always, was always found in the study hall. So they both came. Well, he's talking to Mizach, Hazed, they didn't come one to the other to Shemesh the other because Moshe wouldn't have known how would Aaron know. So they came to him, they were both actually in the study hall. Verse number seven, Yaman I love, and the men said to him, Anachnu to Mayim on Adam, we are defiled to a dead person. The Torah law, the highest level of impurity is when you when you touch a dead person. Or you're in the room with a dead person. So then you become impure. You have to get to have you have to go through a whole concept to get pure again. It takes it can take a, take over a week to become pure. So uh, they said we're impure. It's at a Pesach. Lomenigara. Why should we be excluded? The Vilti Hikim is called not to be able to bring the sacrifice. It's time. Why should we exclude it? He, Moses, told them sacrifices cannot be offered in a state of ritual until we offer my life. So they, they replied, let ritual clean kahanim, sprinkle the blood for us, and let ritual clean kahanim eat the flesh. You know what? Let them do the mitzvah for us. He said to them, wait and I'll hear. Like a disciple confined in, in the hearing the teacher's mouth. Fortune is a mortal who is so confident for whatever he wishes, he can speak to the Shekhin, he can speak to God. Moshe Rabbeinu can speak to God. This portion should really have been said through Moshe, like the rest of the Torah, but these people merited to be said through them. And the merit, in the, for the merit is brought for those who are meritorious. So they demanded my Moshe, what should be done with people that are, are impure, and they uh, want to bring the carbon Pesach, but they're impure. It's not fair. It's once a year situation to bring a carbon Pesach, and now they cannot bring the carbon Pesach because they're impure. So, imagine Moshe Abedin says, Imdu, stand over here. I'm, I'm going to go and check it. I'll make a, I'll make a call. He had a, he had a, a private line straight to God. Imdu Eshma, I will stand over here and I'll go into the base of Mikdash and I'll find I'll talk to God, so to say. I'm gonna talk to God, not I'll ask God this question. God responded. speak to the Jewish people. Ish, ish, If any Jewish person will be unclean to a dead body. He'll be distant from the journey. He'll be far away from the land, the land of Israel. I will say to you for your future generations, but also Pesach Hashem, and it will be, and it'll, and it, it, in the time of the Passover, of, of the time when he's supposed to bring a Pesach to the Abish. So now she said, So you see, on the top of that word, Rechaika, there's two dots. So there's two dots on the top of the, the hey, there's a dot. There's a dot over the word to teach us that he does not really have been far away. But even if he was merely outside the threshold of the temple courtyard, throughout the time, throughout the time allowed for the slaughtering of the Passover sacrifice, on the second Passover, one may keep both leavened bread and unleavened bread food in his home. And there's no festival. The consumption of leaven is not forbidden except while he eats the sacrifice. So it's in the, two, the law of the, we are going to be introduced to the law of the Passover, the second Passover, which is a month later, the 14th day of the year. So on that day, if you were far away from, from Yerushalayim, 
As Rashi just said, you're just out of the Beis Hamidosh and you didn't have a chance to bring the sacrifice on the first Passover. So then, in the second month, the month of the year, in the 14th day of that month, you shall eat it, you eat it with unleavened cakes and bitter herbs. So this is the, the expression is never too late by Judaism. If you miss the first sacrifice, the first uh, Passover, you can do the second Passover. And it has the laws of the Passover sacrifice. The Yeshido and Menad Baker did not leave over anything till the morning. That's only Yeshisperuba, you're not allowed to break any of its bones. Kachol Chukata Pesach. Like any other law of the Passover that was done in the first month, the month of Nisan, Yatsu Oisa, you should do the, if you miss out, you should do it in the second Passover. So this is called Pesach Sheni, the second Passover, which is in the month, a month after the first Passover. Verse 13. But there's a man who's richly clean and he was not anywhere far away. But he decided he's just too lazy. He just didn't do the Passover. He decided to quit. He decided to skip Passover this year. That person shall be cut off from the Jewish nation. He called Hashem because he did not bring the sacrifice of the Passover. That person shall bear, that the Yishahu, that person shall bear his sin. Verse 14. Yager Yitzchem Geh. If a proselyte lives, dwells among you, a convert. Vaatsa Pesach Lashem, and he will make a Passover to God. So you might say, why would a convert make a Passover? He was, his family was not in Egypt. So you might say, why would a convert have to do the Passover? Therefore, the Torah tells us no. Once he becomes a convert, like any other Jew, he follows the laws of Passover. That's what he should do also. There's one law for you, like to you, the depressed and the native born of your world, of your land. Rashid, I might think that anyone who converts should immediately make a Passover sacrifice. Maybe he should make a Passover sacrifice for all the Passovers that he missed. Therefore, scripture teaches us one statue shall be to you and to the proselyte, the native born. And this is the meaning. If a proselyte dwells within you and he becomes, at the time he comes to make the Passover sacrifice with his friends, according to the statute of Passover, in accordance, he shall make it. So the Torah just wants to tell us, not that a gerd, a, a convert that becomes a convert, that he should make a Passover sacrifice for the Passovers that he missed, but that a convert that becomes a convert before Passover celebrates the Passover like every Jew that celebrates the Passover, even though he just became a Jew. And as I said, his parents and his grandparents were not, the great-grandparents were not in Egypt like the Jewish people. But he still celebrates the Passover like every single Jew. That is the promise for today. We now go to the Tanya of the day. Again, we continue the, the fourth chapter of, uh, of Shara Yichad Ve'emunah, very Kabbalistic concepts we're talking over here. So you just have to listen to what the Alta Rebbe says. It's very short, but just listen and soak in the Kabbalistic terms and the Kabbalistic concepts. For this, to comprehend, you have to read this a hundred times. Simpson, the contraction and the concealment of the life force. Nikra b'shem kalim. It's called in Kabbalistic terms, kalim, vessels. So in Chassidut, we are taught, there are two things. There's oil, there's the light, and there are vessels. And the life force is called the vessel. That's called the oil, the light. So for example, the light, the neshama, your soul, my soul is the light. And my body is a vessel. The thought is the light. The word that I say is the vessel. 
So everything has an oil and a kli, a light and a vessel. Just like a vessel covers up, that's what's within it. So too, tzimtzum, the concept of a, of a contraction, what does that mean? It's like a vessel. It's a vessel that hides the oil in it. So it, so it, 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 it brings down the life force, like, that, like, like water. Water is like oil, it's pure, simple. I put it into a red vessel. Now water, the water looks red. The water is, it didn't change by putting it into the red vessel. The water stays simple and pure water. The vessel gives it another color. I put it now into a blue vessel, it looks blue. Or if I take oil, it's a light. I put a, I put a, I put a bulb, a red bulb, or a white bulb, or a clear bulb. They're all the same light. It's the vessel that gives the light, give, changes the color of the light. Not the light doesn't change, the light is the same light. But the vessel now, the light that comes from a red bulb is going to be red. Not because of the light, but because of the bulb. So that's the concept. The Kalim, when we say that God created the world through the, I started my mother through the 10 utterances, 10 the words of the Torah. So the vessels are the letters. The letters are just the vessels. The letters are the vessels that the oil, that the light of God comes within these vessels. So the 10 divine utterances for the substitutes and transpositions we mentioned before, which are the life force of the created beings are the vessels that give the capability that the life, that the earth that comes through these vessels gives the, the, the next step, the capability of life. Shart and Avaya, all these letters are rooted in the five letters, Menatzpach. Menatzpach is the interesting five letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Menatzpach are each one of these letters have a final letter to it. You know, yeah, so you, in, in, in the Hebrew alphabet, you have mem as a final mem. Nun has a final nun. Tzaddik has a final tzaddik. Fei has a final fei. Chaf has a final, has a final shi. Each of these letters have Look at number 12, the five letters have two alternative forms, one which is used and one and it, term, and, and, and it terminates a word. Since these, their, their use in this way restricts the appearance of any other future letters. It is an act of limitation and hence an expression of the, of, of the attribute of Gevuda. So the Natspach, a final letter, Final men. You cannot have a letter after a final letter because it's finalized. It's interesting. These five letters create a final letter. There's no, uh, there's no other letter in Hebrew that has a final letter. So we have five final letters in Hebrew. Don't ask me why, the, why it was picked these five final I don't know. You have to really know the concept of the letters to understand all its ramifications. So these are the five final letters. Final mem, final nun, final tzaddik, final fe, final chaf. What means the final letter? That means if anything ends with, a, with one of these letters, mem, nun, tzaddik, fe, chaf, then you, you end it with this, with a final mem. You never end the letter with a regular mem. You end it with a final mem. The final mem means that that is the end of the letter. You cannot add anything more to this letter. If, if, if the letter would end in any other way, you could always add something to the letter, to the word, to the word. Once you put the final mem at the end of the letter, that's its finality. It finishes it. So that's why in Kabbalah, 
these five letters are called Gevura. Out of all the letters in the Hebrew alphabet, these five letters are called the letters of severity because they end a word. And in Kabbalistic teachings, there are five degrees of Gevura. Five degrees of severity. Since there are then five degrees of severity, five restraining forces that divide and separate the breath of the voice in the five organs of speech, thus enabling the 22 letters to be formed. So the explanation is thus as the five physical organs of speech divide sound and letters into five separate categories, so too do the five spiritual levels of Gevura give rise to the 22 supernal letters because they create the vessels for the 22. So they finalize the words. They bring about, the because any other way, any other, in, in essence, I mean, any other, if you don't put a final letter to a word, Every word can be can be can be can be continued. Every word can be added letters if you know how to use that words and how to use the letters. But if the second you add a final letter to a to a letter to a word, that finalizes the letter. And you cannot add another letter to this word. So so to the mouth, the image that created that you speak to the five organs of your mouth. So in essence, that's the Buddha, because you, the capability of speech needs to be unlimited, but then your mouth, the five organs of your mouth, bring your, your, your speech into a very, it's, it's, it's moderate, it's, it confines it, so that, you, that a certain part of your mouth gives out a certain uh, uh, letters, and a certain body mouth gives out different, different, different letters, different words. So your mouth actually, the five concepts of your mouth, even Kabbalah and Esther says, the five concepts of your mouth, the, the, the palate, the teeth, the tongue, the breath, all, and all of these are, are, are gavura, are severity of the mouth. They can, they can, they can find the capability of your words. And they are connected to the five guttural letters, the five final letters, I mean, not guttural, the five final letters, menatzpach. The shayrish heigivudis and the source of these five levels of severity in term in Kabbalah, it's called Butzna de Kedusha. I mean, Butzna de Kadunisa, which are made for a little light from darkness. The darkness being a level of concealment that transcends the light. Number 13 over here, this concealment of light is the spiritual limit, limiting forces which determines the quality, quantity, and quality of light and energy in each world, sphere and being, thereby imposing all limitations and differentiation inherent in creation. So that is, in essence, darkness. There's darkness that we see, and there's a darkness that's really the, that's really light. But it's so light that it's dark. So that's the expression darkness being a level of concealment that transcends light. And that's, that is a concept even in science. They have so the light is so intense that it collapses into darkness. You only see darkness. She love the Atikaman. This is the supernal gavura of Atikaman. The spiritual level of Keser that transcends all the worlds, even the world of Attilus. So in that world, light is dark. 
So that's why in Kabbalah we learned many times in Tanya that actually severity in this world is really higher than chesed. It really has within it a very deep concept of light. And that's why great things come out of challenges. Great things come out of challenges in life. If we would know how to how to how to uh, how to harness a challenge, and that's why it says great great is light that comes out of darkness than light that comes out of light. That means that that, that, that there's, there's a greater light that comes from darkness than dark than light that comes from light. Because in the essence of darkness is light. It's just such a light that cannot be revealed. Very intense light. She need the rid of Allah, which is a supernal gavod of Atik Yemrai. But Shayri Shah Sadin. And the source of Chesed is also Atik Yemrai, is also uh, 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 goes higher than that. So, therefore, really, the source of light it also comes from darkness. You do a liyade chain as a note to those who know Kabbalah. So now you look in the, in the explanation. Since the symptom in the letters, on one hand, and the revelation of divine light and life force, on the other hand, both eminently, but Yemen, this is a Kabbalistic term which goes on before, before the Atik Yemen is a Kabbalistic uh, uh, term that goes on the, on, 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 on the, on the on the concept before before even the world of Attila, before the world of a nation. It's the Kesser, the Kesser before even the world of Attila. It follows that the symptom does not affect an object, not affect an objective concealment as viewed from the common source above. Where, as previously explained, no entity can conceal itself from itself. Thus, symptom affects and is only felt by created beings, who, because of their concealment, are unable to perceive the divine life force that continuously creates them. This is necessary in order for them to think of themselves as independent existence, a state which must be felt by them. If they are, if they are to tangibly exist, the truth, however, they are utterly nullified within the source above, and everything is all, uh, and everything is ultimately to, uh, nullified to the earth, uh, to the light of God, which is above and beyond any uh, any aspect of light and darkness, and that really is manatva, the really the vessel. So that's why Chassidah said the vessel is even higher than the than the than the oil. The vessel that that's why only a vessel can handle light. Because the vessel, which we look like as a contraction, really is its source, it's higher than the light. The light itself comes from the place where the vessel comes from. And that's why the vessel, the mitzvah, the body. That's why the body in, in, in Kabbalah has its has its place higher than, than, than the soul. The, the word has its place higher than the, than the soul. The, the Kabbalistic term that ends the Tanya of the day. Um, okay, so today is the 14th day of the month. As I said, this is the Tanya you got to read a couple of times. To just uh, read it and read it and read it, and then slowly will uh, will uh, will uh, penetrate. As we say, the story of Akiva, he saw he saw a stone. He said, "How I'm 40 years old. How am I going to be able to learn Torah?" So then he saw a stone, and he saw water dropping on it. And over many years, water dropping on a stone made the hole in the stone. So he said, "If a, if a very." It, water, which is light, can make a hole in a in a thick stone, then Torah can make a hole in my thick head. So 
by learning and learning and learning and reading it over and over, let the words of Torah slowly penetrate our heads, we'll be able to even understand these very spiritual concepts in our life. But they're very powerful aspects and they give us a lot of, lot of, they give us a lot of capabilities to understand these aspects in Kabbalah, the way to be able to handle our life, because to realize again that to realize that a challenge, a very important thing of Siddhis, that a Khoisha, which we look at as Gevura, severities and challenges in life, actually come from a very, very high place. They come from a place that is higher than all the goodness that you can have in this world. They come from a place that are going to bring out your Neshama. That's why a challenge is called in, in Torah, it's called a Nisayan, Nisayan, a challenge. But it, it also comes from the word nets, which is a miracle. And miracles happen when we can overcome our challenges, when we can overcome our darknesses in our life. And we can overcome the darknesses of life that we go through in life. Then we, we reveal a light that was never, would never be here if it wasn't through this darkness. And that's why we're going through gullus in general. Why did you didn't have to go through, why did your world and Jews have to go through exile? Because the light that is revealed through the through the, the, the challenges of exile is a light that would never be revealed without it. So that's the expression, greater is the light that comes from darkness than the light that comes from light. So why? Because the light that comes from darkness is the, is the darkness itself has within it such a deep light that cannot be revealed without going through this. And that's the teaching, that's in essence the teaching of today's time. Wow. But the the, uh, the, the film of today, the chapter, uh, the, today is the 14th day, chapter 72, 73, 74, 75, 76. So 72 to 76, and the hill the Psalms, and you would have done the chit of the day. Also, a reminder, tonight at 7.30, we're going to have a class in JLI in the Pash of the week. Yeah. I'll see you all tonight yeah. at 7.30. Can I ask a question? Can you ask a question? Have a wonderful, beautiful day. <laughs> Can I ask?